Thank you all for being here. Uh, as Ambika Didi said, I am um, especially grateful here for the presence here of two people who have made it high up the mountain uh, more than once. And that is Mr. Reinhold Messner and Kimlal Devkota. Um, Reinhold Messner, uh, of course, uh, is a world legend and I place him, sir, um, in the pantheon starting with Mallory. And I would perhaps mention Tenzing and Hillary and Doug Scott. And of course, uh, it's going strong, uh, Reinhold Messer. So I'm, it's a special privilege to be, to be here with, in, in your presence. And um, Kimlal Devkotaji over at the back. Gautam Bani, my friend. Devkota Bani. My mind, my Devkota Orgya sir. Himlal Gautam ji, I mentioned to you earlier and corrected in my article in Himal Media this morning. Himlal Gautam ji climbed Everest twice to uh, to finalize the the height of Everest. Uh, and uh, at one point, stayed uh, Mr. Messner on the summit for two hours, doing his tabulations. So welcome, uh, Himlal Gautam ji, like Pani. Yeah. And as, uh, the, as for the subject and the, the third presence in our room today, uh, who may or may not have it made it to the top, most likely not, uh, in my own personal view, uh, is uh, George Lay Mallory, who Reinhold Messner has uh, essentially anointed him as the spiritual father of high altitude mountaineering. And indeed, for him, yes, he does deserve applause, Mr. Mallory. Uh, gone all these years, lost on the summit on, uh, in 1924. So, uh, the person I miss dearly here, and you will understand especially why in today's context, is uh, Miss Holly, Elizabeth Holly, uh, who has had a particular role in my personal involvement in the, the Mallory story. Uh, since 1975 in terms of my personal interest. Uh, that will become clear as we move on. Uh, let's uh, go, I'll, I have some slides and I will read off some particularly some pithy quotes from uh, George Lay Mallory because he was a word craftsman besides being a mountain craftsman. And uh, I believe that uh, because the very first expedition to, 19, uh, to Everest in 1921 had such an evocative prose writer, who is also a poet actually, in that trip, that gave a momentum and a cultural energy to high altitude mountaineering uh, to make it much more than a sport. And uh, that's why I feel that uh, this uh, particular day is important because we are very close to the end of 2021. And as Amrika Didi said, the reason to do it in a hurry um, before the end of 2021 is to be able to mark the centenary. Uh, centenaries have been coming fast and furious. One of them, which we were all reminded of, not uh, till another two years, but suddenly we got excited about the Nepal-India, uh, British-India Treaty, the British-Nepal Treaty of 1923, which made Nepal sovereign in the modern era. And yet, in Nepal, the discussion is always about the 1950 treaty and the Sugauli Treaty, never about the 1923 treaty. So we were getting excited about a centenary two years hence and to mark it uh, because we in Nepal get carried away by all kinds of populist propaganda and we don't look at where the reality is. So in among the treaties to highlight the 1923 treaties, among the mountaineers to highlight George Lay Mallory and in particular his naming of Pumori or let us put it another way, what I consider to be, my research has shown, uh, his involvement in the naming of 
Humori. I think uh, we should uh, move right away to the first uh, slide. So, the context of the expedition of 1921 was the fact that you could not take the direct route from Calcutta up to the plains and up to uh, up the Arun Valley uh, or any of the other side valleys into Everest because Nepal was a closed quote unquote closed kingdom at that point. It was not clo closed for mercantilism, but it was closed geopolitically. Uh, as a result, you will find it very interesting that Kathmandu Valley was quite connected to the rest of South Asia, culturally and economically, but not geopolitically. As a result, what did they have to do? They had to have the great Indian trigonometrical survey had to base itself on that arc around the border of Nepal and have the theodolites all aimed on the mountains, which in those days of lesser haze, you could see clearly from deep in the Bihar plains, which on a clear day, on a very ex exceptional day, you can do even today, but then it was more general. So they were able to triangulate. And so you got here, that is the Kanchenjunga group. And this is what they call the Mahalangur Himal. And within Mahalangur Himal, that particular one, uh, this one here, is Everest, Chomalongma, later Sagarmatha. So this is the triangulation looking over all of Nepal, which would be about here, right? And now let's go to the next, next map. Now it shows you from the other side, Nepal is all down here. So Nepal was truly in that sense forbidden. The map makers couldn't get in and the adventurers couldn't get in. So what do we have in this very first map of uh, geological map of the uh, region north of Everest, which is around here, around here. Uh, it doesn't show here, sorry, but this is around Everest. This is the Arun River and the Arun River, we tend to think just goes north from, from uh, uh, East Nepal into Tibet, but it actually curves all the way to north of Kathmandu. And also it waters the north of Everest, including the Rongbuk Glacier. This is the Kathmandu area. This is the Rolwaling area. Kathmandu is down here. This is north of Kathmandu, Rolwaling, Everest. So this is the Arun River. This is the Everest area. This is Rolwaling. So they had to, what they had to do was go north from Sikkim, which is here, over the Jalepla, into, they didn't go to Lhasa, of course, they turned left at um, uh, Kampajong. And from Kampajong, they took a tributary of the Arun that goes westward to Tingri. And from Tingri, they came south. And these are the names that the Newar traders of Kathmandu Valley would know from the inside. Um, in fact, um, as part of their daily, uh, the lives that they left, lived in terms of the traverse from Kathmandu to Kuti and north of this whole mountain range to towards Lhasa via Shigatse. Shigatse of course being a Newar name of 10 houses, Shigatse. Uh, and we write it today as Shigatse or the Chinese write it as X-I-A-T-S-E. <laughs> Next one. This is Miss Holly and I have to pay my respects to her here before this audience because as a neophyte journalist who started writing articles as I traveled around Nepal and thus became a journalist writing about parts of Nepal for the Kathmandu audience in English and later in Nepali, I started out as a kind of a travel writer. And when I decided they needed, there's need for some research, I got interested in Everest and Mallory. So the place to go to and a welcoming person, although she had a stern demeanor for the public, was our own Miss Holly. And Miss Holly told me, if you need to do research, Kanak, you have to go to the British Library and read up the books on Mallory, which I did. And what I came up with with this column, Mallory of Everest. This was the date is uh, May 15, 1975. And I thought I was 20, but Shanta tells me I was 19 if that were the case. So I was 19 when I put together this article. And since then, Mallory has never left my, uh, my, the, my spectrum of interests. And uh, so one of the 
most excruciating and saddest episodes for me personally was in uh, May 1999 when Mallory's body, after 75 years out there in the cold, exposed, freeze dried essentially, was brought to light. The tweed, the, the embroidered handkerchief still in his pocket, uh, his, um, his boots, hobnailed boots, the clothing that he wore, everything there and his body sprawled. I, have, I haven't had the heart to bring that photograph before you, but it's seared in our memories in terms of how he would have fallen and what would have happened to him. But all what I have to say today is between 1921, mostly 1921 and how it ended, I'm not going to get into, nor into the age old debate of whether did he get to the top or not. Next. The reason we have to be grateful for uh, Mallory's letters that make up the tome of the first discoveries around Everest and in literary form, which therefore gives that emotional and cultural energy to mountaineering, high altitude mountaineering, which I referred to earlier, is the lady, um, Ruth Mallory, who uh, they had a family together, three children the oldest of whom was Claire and uh, there was obviously not just uh, great and deep affection between these two but also an intellectual camaraderie that had them writing to each other in detail about everything that went the, the earlier day from, from gardening to family uh, disturbances to neighborly matters to great issues of the day of how to bring up your children. Mallory went into war before he got to Everest. He spent, I think, about 16 or 17 months in the battlefield, something we don't hear about enough. We know of how he was in the trenches in the Western Front, how he suffered the poisonous gases how he was injured, I think, by a bullet on his ankle and he had to be evacuated. Then he went back again into the front. So he was a, a, a soldier, an artillery man in the First World War. That itself would have made a story. We don't remember of that too much. Nor do we remember the fact that he was a scholar, a poet with very good prose, but he was not making money off it. And he was wondering how to survive. And he was expecting that the fame that he would get on Everest may help him in some of his crusades as one of his writer friends have written to us that he may then go on the lecture circuit which he had already started going on he already knew about lecture circuits uh, the time when he made that famous statement um, because it's there was to a New York Times correspondent in 1923 in New York when he was on a tour of the US to raise money for the 1924, the last expedition. I should tell you, uh, just before I get into too many years, there were three expeditions that were, uh, Mallory went to on Everest. Before that, he climbed in the British Isles, in the Alps, and then to Everest. 1921, the one that I'm primarily concerned with here. 1922, when he then concentrated on the North Coal and doing the assault on the summit. And 1924, same route where he disappears until found in 1999. So these are three uh, expeditions over all of four years. So with Ruth, the letters that he writes back to Ruth, obviously sent by runners and therefore arriving a month or late, more than a month later, nevertheless, a very contemporaneous writings about his climb, the approach march, the, the discovery, the climb. He wrote to some other people as well, but mostly to Ruth. And that is from where we got the details of the expedition. Uh, so much to learn. Let's go to the next one. So the earlier I told, I showed you the larger uh, image, and this is again the map uh, from the 1921 expedition. This is where they came up, having gone to Tingri and moved Kampajong over here. Uh, Sikkim down there, sorry, at the corner of the frame, uh, up that way. Uh, this is not working. Okay, anyway, 
what's happening. OK, this is the Rongo Glacier. The big stem comes up towards the North Coal on this side. This is the East Rongo Glacier, which they actually did not discover in the beginning, which is why they spent time in this part, which is why we are privileged and I'm privileged to make this presentation before you. Because had Mallory discovered this little gap, they, when they were coming up, they thought, what can there be behind this little gap here? But it turns out the East Rongbuk Glacier debouches, if that's the right term, into the main Rongbuk Glacier. What Mallory did, does is, he first comes up here, uh, and then comes up to the main Rongbuk stem, this way, towards the base of the North Coal, this is Lola, that is right above the base camp, uh, under the west ridge of Everest. And then they go back and they come here in this way. And then this is the place that we are interested in today's presentation. He comes up and then finally comes up to this pass, whose, whose name I have not been able to locate. Uh, some of you may know, um, Mr. Messner or, or Kim Lalji. But this is the, the peak between uh, Lingtern and Pumori, right here. The pass is Lingtern Nup and Lingtern here. And then this is looking down into the, um, into the uh, base camp, the Everest uh, Kumbu Icefall. So this is the general uh, terrain we're talking about. Next. So I told you how this, coming west from Kambajong, they came into the, the for left fork of the Arun, which then leads towards Tingri. This is the terrain that he describes. Very desolate, very desert-like, compared to what he sees later, and of course, what he has seen earlier. Next. <clears throat> this is just to give you a non-photographic rendering. His, uh, the colleague uh, of Mallory, uh, that's Norton, did this watercolor, and uh, what you got is the top of Everest and uh, the snow constantly blowing off uh, the summit, which is a kind of a signature that we know of Everest, which is blocking the view of Lhotse. And I personally believe that, that the mountain, the little mountain to the right, which is of course further away in the horizon and hence lower, is uh, Pumori, this one here. This is from Pangla. This is the pass, I think, towards uh, Kharta. After having done their climbing here, then they went to the other side. Now, I would now present to you uh, the photograph of Pumori taken on the West Rongbuk Glacier, from the West Rongbuk Glacier uh, towards Pumori, the mountain of our interest today. That's Pumori. And uh, this is the tents, and this is looking west. When they go around the edge towards the left, over here, is when they go towards the pass that I talked to you about, when he, where they look down onto the Everest base camp. But this is Pumori in her glory, because Pumori is certainly a lady. And uh, I've got a close up of this one. Pumori. Let me read up. This is essentially my, the core of my presentation today. So I'll have to read it out to you because it is a letter from Mallory. On 18 July, camped at the head of the West Rongbo Glacier between Lingtern and Lingtern Nook, Mallory penned a letter to his wife Ruth, one of the many which make up a great written archive of his three forays to Everest. Mallory wrote on 18 July, 1921. At night, before we turned in, the moonlight scene, I'll repeat, at night before we turned in, the moonlit scene was half veiled in cloud. And in the early morning, the moon was still up and the peaks clearer. One mountain in particular, on the far side of the snow-covered glacier, was singularly lovely. I call it, for the present, Mount Clare, and I hope the name will stick. This was Mallory exactly a century and a few months ago, writing about Pumori. And here I write, the name did stick, but it was transmog transmogrified into Pumori. 
Mallory was upon the West Ring Roan book with a team of Sherpas, besides his climbing companion, companion Guy Bullock. Pumo, Pumo or Bhumo means daughter in Himalayan dialects and re denotes a peak. It is believed that the Sherpas decided to adapt the christening into their own tongue, the daughter peak. And hence you have Pumori. And uh, for me, the evocation of this uh, from Mallory, his daughter back in Surrey with the family, Ruth and family, himself here, the moon is still up. It was obviously clear, lit, uh, clear night with a moonlit night and in the morning he writes this. So uh, this says so much, but then there's so much more to say, which is why my presentation is only half over, if you will. Um, I then realized after I spoke to Ambika Didi and we gave it the title Mallory and Pumori, I realized that this presentation will not be enough without Mallory and Everest and Pumori because he had done us the favor, the world, of exploring the western regions of Mount Everest. And uh, so what does he write about that? And what is, why is it of interest to us here in Nepal in particular? Mallory never came to Nepal, but he is vital for us. Not only because he was one of the first trainers of the Sherpas and some of the other uh, ethnicities of the climbing community, but mostly Sherpas who were coming up from Darjeeling, where they were, did the job of quote unquote coolies. And much of the literature of Mallory also refers to the Sherpas as quote unquote coolies. Um, so when he comes up here, our interest here in Nepal is that uh, he was looking down on Nepal and remarking in his notepad on the mountains that is south on Nepal. He saw to the south on Nepal. But let us not go too far for now. Let's just concentrate on what he saw on the Nepal side because he was later to go to the east side, Kharta Valley, Kama Valley, and then uh, up to the East Rongbuk Glacier from that direction, not from the north, but from the east, which I will explain uh, before it gets too confusing. But here he was in the west and he looked down from, uh, I believe he didn't get to Lola himself, but then this other pass uh, between Pumori and, um, and Lingtren, he looks down and there are two entries. Let me read both entries to you. And, and they are slightly repetitive. Here is what Mallory wrote from the high pass looking across and over. Now this is the point. When, he, when I quote him, please make the, understand why he writes across over. Because he was, a, he was a, a craftsman of words. He knew what he was writing. We're not talking about mountains this way. He's already that high. And when he looks into the western comb, he's looking across and over. So he writes, it was a clear dawn and the mountains were indescribably beautiful, wonderful. And the best of it was, I now saw the Kum, CWM. It is an amazing cirque, which is a uh, synonym for the Kum. And he's talking about the Western Kum. The great rocky peak south of Everest, and I will not show you the image. Oh, it's already there. All right, I was going to keep you in suspense, but yeah, this is the Kum. He is here, between Lengthren and Pumori, this pass, which means to come there, he has to come west wrong book and then up this branch. Uh, sorry, this is moving a bit. So this is the pass from which he looks down. Earlier, he, if he had been to Lola, he would have seen a different view. But then I will read what he says from here because the ridge north peak, Nupse is north peak, Lotse is south peak. This is the south call, this is the western Kum. This is the North Coal, and this is the route that they come later to the North. So what he writes is, The great rocky peak south of Everest, Lotse, is joined by a serrated ridge to the broken top of another huge crinkled mountain to the west, Nupse. I mean, I, would, I have never read Nupse described from that angle. Because Nupse, as we know it, is a Nepali Mandari Puche Himal. It's a tiny mountain compared to Lotse and Everest. Yet, all the most of the tourism brochures show Everest, but it's Nupse that looms. Because Nupse is right over base camp and 
next to Kalapathar. So this is interesting that he calls it the crinkled mountain to the west and not of great importance. Whereas from the base camp it looms. The west facing slopes of Everest are a series of fierce rock ribs. And all the other sides of the Kum, which I saw, are fearsomely steep. Everest itself blocked out the sun, all the sun, and the Kum remained a cold, dark hollow behind the brightly lit snows. Our next plan is to force a way over our coal and down to the Kum. So here what, what Mallory is saying is, later in the next paragraph I'll read to you, he says, oh, we can't go there, but that's Nepal. But then here he's saying the plan is to go down. So he says, I, we won't go down, but that's in a way, you know, because we couldn't get there good enough, fair enough, we'll move elsewhere because we can't go there anyway, because that's Nepal. Here's the paragraph I'm referring to. We reached the coal, and this is the coal for sure between uh, Pumori and Lingtren. We reached the coal at 5 a.m., a fantastically beautiful scene, and we looked across the Western Kum at last, across at the Western Kum at last, terribly cold and forbidding under the shadow of Everest. It was nearly an hour after sunrise that the sun hit the West Peak, but another disappointment, it is a big drop, about 1,500 feet down to the glacier, and a hopeless precipice. However, we have seen this Western Glacier and, and are not sorry that we are not to go up it. <laughs> Remember, this is where everybody till today is going up, right? But this is what, this shows you the danger of the Kumbu icefall and why Mallory himself was saying, Nepali ma hitchi chaya bancha ni, hitchi chaya ko manche, but this is where we have been forced to go, okay? However, we have seen this Western Glacier and are not sorry that we are not to go up it. It is terribly steep and broken. In any case, work on this side could only be carried out from a base in Nepal. And so we are done with the western side. It was not a likely chance that the gap between Everest and South Peak could be reached from the west. From what we have seen now, I do not fancy that it would be possible even uh, to get, uh, could one get up the glacier. So what he's saying is, this is impossible. And even if you got over this broken ice fall, he doesn't think you can make it to the top because you, what he has seen is this steep side and he might have thought, and this is where the expert mountaineers who have themselves climbed this area would be able to say it because I am a, um, a, a mountain fanatic without being a mountaineer, is I think from where we are and if this rendition is correct and I think it is, from uh, Lola, he would not see the South Pole. This ridge comes in the way. So he wouldn't have seen the passage up the Western Coombe into South Coal, which made it possible to climb from this area. This is the other part that touches me when I talk about um, Mallory, because we know that after the 30s uh, and slowly Tibet closed down, Nepal opened up in 1949 and uh, 50, you had um, you know, Annapurna climbed by Herzog, Eric Shipton, Tillman, the works. They were all swarming over these mountains. Swarming is not the right word, but yes, they were all over these mountains. And uh, so what he writes is this, from this point, please imagine, he's here, but he has also been some other places where, from where he can look across. So what he writes is, 19 July. We saw a lovely group of mountains away to the south in Nepal. I wonder what they are and whether anything is known about them. A simple enough sentence or two sentences, but it evokes a sense of history in me. That he is, as a mountaineer, he's seen what Tibet has to offer. And this is the southern edge of Tibet. There are not many mountains there. They're mostly the plateau. But he sees peaks and peaks and peaks. And so his mountaineer's desire and the explorer's desire is evoked at this point. And so I will now come towards the end. We are forced to consider that Everest was described to the world as the third pole by Mallory for the very first time. So what does he do? Even today, we are forced to consider Mallory's first ever description of Everest and its three main arets, the ridge lines, converging towards the top. Without a, and he writes, there's no spire at the top. I realized this suddenly. Yes, indeed. Mount Everest, the tallest, has to be regal. 
And these little spires doesn't work. You've got to have a solid mass and a pyramid to show the world that you are the tallest. This is how I read Mallory when he says, Without, this is me paraphrasing Mallory, without a spire at the top, but a broad summit pyramid with mild slopes at that point, regal as the highest spot on earth should be. Mallory saw the massive as a rocky protrusion with windswept, windswept snow and writes that only the Kangshung face actually has snow overhangs. This is how our, uh, the Everest massive was first described to the world by Mallory. Quote, Everest is a rugged giant. It has not the smooth undulations of a snowy mountain with white cap and glaciated flanks. And I say, thank God for that, right? It is rather a rock mass coated often with layer of white powder, which is blown about its sides. It has no spire. Everest is generally speaking convex, steep in lower parts and slanting, slanting back to the summit. To me, the way to evoke in those days before, uh, you know, easy photography and is through words. And this is what he says, Everest is, Everest, uh, is, in, in, is generally speaking convex, steep in the lower parts, the three arets, and the slanting back to the summit. And this, he writes, Everest was not one mountain, but two. His reference was to Lhotse. Because for some reason, at some point, and Mallory also changes his views on certain peaks, but perhaps before he went too close and saw the South Coal in its depression, he thought that Everest and the South Peak, which is Lhotse, essentially made up one massive. The way today, the way today we say Lhotse and Lhotse Shar are the same, uh, this might be what he had thought then. So now, As far as the, and now I'll come to a series of quotes from Mallory, which are not necessarily part of uh, the 1921 exploration. Then I will speak a bit about the Sherpas and I'll, uh, in the expedition, then I'll conclude my presentation. As far as the term, the, the, the line, because it is there is concerned, it is trite. You could read it as just a, either a stupid answer or an answer to a stupid question. Or you could say that, is there something missing in it? Indeed, Ma Mallory could be brusque and matter of fact, as when in 1923, he had to respond to one more time to a New York Times reporter as to why he sought to climb Everest, quote, because it is there. But the rest of his answer to the reporter, rarely highlighted, shows that to be more than a throwaway line. Quote, Everest is the highest mountain in the world and no man has reached its summit. Its existence is a challenge. The answer is instinctive. The answer to the question is instinctive a part, I, instinctively a part, I suppose, of man's desire to conquer the universe. And that applies to us till today. Mallory, I might have shared this with you earlier, planned to join the League of Nations. Uh, did I talk about the League of Nations? No. So, here is the broad vision of the man. His idea was he would climb as long as he could. He would make a name for himself. Through that name, he would give lectures, he would write books, and he would earn a living for his family. And that is a concern, as you see in the letters exchanged between Ruth and Mallory. Then, he planned to work beyond uh, academia, not just teach, but to do something for, if you will, and I'm paraphrasing, world peace as somebody who had seen battle close up in the trenches of the First World War. So uh, an admirer of him, admirer of his writes this, Mallory worked out an original scheme for promoting international understanding by a development of geography teaching. Him being a mountaineer, and he seems to have felt maybe there's a via media of teaching geography as a way of inculcating empathy among peoples. So. Understanding by a development of promoting international understanding by a development of geography teaching in connection with the work of the League of Nations. The adventure of Mount Everest intervened and he was not a little influenced in his decision to undertake it. Meaning he was influenced in, a, in his decision to undertake Mount Everest climb because, invo because it involved the sacrifice of his peculiarly happy home life. 
but by the support of which in this grim field of mountaineering might lead to his crusade. His crusade meaning, by the way, besides taking care of his peculiarly happy family life, lead to his crusade of international understanding of peace and amity. So this to me, as I was, this particular facet I discovered only three days ago while I was researching this presentation. And that opens a small extra window for me on Mallory. Uh, now let's go, I'll read up with him looking straight at us. I'll quickly read through three quotes that are not in three paragraphs. He was a literary man. So here is how he describes when they were going west from Kampajong and uh, you know this was mid monsoon. So going up from Sikkim, it was, everything was clouded, they saw nothing. <coughs> when they up, went up to Tibet, Kampajong going eastward, they went up a hill. I think it was Guy, Bullock and he. They went up a hill to look around to see if they could see Everest. And then suddenly they saw a glint of ice. And then they saw clouds opening up parts of a mountain and closing up again and as if giving him a great, you know, curtain call, so to speak, in the, an, an ab initio curtain call where he's sown almost uh, tantalizingly bits and parts until he gets a vision of the whole. And this is what he writes. Therefore, uh, then after that, it opens up completely. And so he writes that evening, Everest was a prodigious white fang, excrescent from the jaws of the world. We were satisfied that the highest mount of mountains would not disappoint us. Throughout his much closer acquaintance with the high mountain, the awe for Everest never left Mallory, even though he saw much more. He wrote, I sometimes think of this expedition. There were times when he got despondent. He was extremely angry apparently at some point, maybe some frustrations during the climb with young Francis, young husband, who went this very route, not towards Everest, but when uh, the British invaded 1903, the British invasion of Tibet, aided by Chandra Samshir, who essentially betrayed Tibet as an historical ally and friend uh, by giving uh, support, logistical and soldiers, to young husband as the British invader of Tibet. It's called the young husband mission, but it should be called the young husband invasion of Tibet. So young husband goes up there, blah, blah, he does everything, but then he goes back and he becomes the chairman of the Mount Everest committee. Together and uh, the British Alpine Club is involved, the Royal Geographical Society is involved. Many of the photographs you will see now are from the Royal Geographical Society collection. So Mallory lived at a uh, young husband and for which I'm not unhappy, uh, says this. I sometimes think of this expedition as a fraud, 1921. I sometimes think of this expedition as a fraud from beginning to end, invented by the wild enthusiasm of one man, young husband, puffed up by the would-be wisdom of certain pundits in the Alpine club and imposed upon the useful ardor of your humble servant. Certainly, this requires reading one more time, right? He says, I sometimes think of this expedition as a fraud from the beginning to end, invented by the wild enthusiasm of one man, young husband, puffed up by the would-be wisdom of certain pundits in the Alpine club and imposed upon the youthful order of your humble servant. Certainly, the reality must be strangely different from their dream. The long-imagined snow slopes of this northern face of Everest with their gentle and inviting angle turn out to be the most appalling precipice, nearly 10,000 feet. The prospect of ascent in any direction is about nil and our present job is to run our, run our noses against the impossible in such a way as to persuade mankind that some noble heroism has failed once again. This is uh, something coming out of his heart as you can see and uh, I think um, young husband back in England did not sleep that night. During the second 1922 expedition, Mam Mallory survived an avalanche below North Cole which took the lives of seven porters, seven Sherpas. Before that accident, he had written, frankly, the game is not good enough. So you can see in the next couple of tweaks, uh, I said tweets, <laughs> in the next couple of quotes, um, tweets were not invented in Mallory's day. So we're where we are today. 
you'll see that Malari is ambivalent. He is sometimes energetic and go to spirit, sometimes rather despondent and uh, defeatist. Frankly, the game is not good enough. Uh, the risks of getting caught are too great. The margin of strength when men are at great heights is too small. Perhaps it's mere folly to go up again. But how can I be out of the hunt? And then he writes, he had a um, clandestine, if one might use the word, correspondent with a young lady friend who he had never met. I, I don't have her name here. Um, but he had never met, but they had kept up a correspondence. So in one of his writings in 1923, as he's planning for the Everest trip, he writes to this lady friend, my chief feeling is we've got to get to the top next time or never. We must get there and we shall. Here a pause while I imagine myself getting to the top. So that's being also a little coquettish with his, with his friend, imagining himself going to the top. He's written a couple of other instances of getting to the top and how it might feel, how it's actually harder to be on the top than to work to get to the top. I haven't brought those into this, uh, this presentation here. He writes, I can write but one line. This is when he, his last posted letter before disappearing into the clouds. You know, he's moving up with Andrew Irvine uh, and uh, Odell looking from his binoculars, suddenly sees high up two people two figures moving onward and that is the last visual sighting the last letter is this where he writes i can write but one line and this is from high up on the mountain i can write but one line we are on the point of moving up again and the adventure appears more desperate than ever so the death of the seven sherpas must have also been part this is my understanding the death of the seven Sherpas in the earlier expedition of 1922 must also have been part of what impelled Mallory towards the top in 1924 as a kind of redemption for the lives lost. And some might say, oh, but he was a mountaineer and he wouldn't have felt that much for the Sherpas. But my last section here where I talk about his views on the support staff, porters, Sherpas, will explain to you perhaps he was more sensitive than we give him credit for or we may give him credit for. Uh, here is the point. I, I have used the word poignancy more than once. Let me use it one more time here. Besides everything that Everest, uh, Mallory saw from the, uh, not from Lola, but from his other pass, because I believe he didn't get to Lola, I would stand corrected, or from the other peaks when they looked down into Nepal. He also had Sherpas with him. And this is why I want to end with talking about the indigenous people, the local inhabitants of East Nepal, of Khumbu, of Upper Khumbu in particular. Um, more touching it is to note that even as they made the arduous trek, I should start here. While the story of Everest exploration from the north is replete with reference to the Sahibs, it was after all the Sherpas who made all these three expeditions possible at all. And it is interesting to chart the evolution of these, what you may call laborers, in the colonial summer retreat of Darjeeling, evolving into the mainstay of high altitude mountaineering. More touching it is to note that even as they made the arduous trek up through Sikkim, across the high plateau, and coming up from Tibet to look down on the Khumbu landscape together with Mallory, Bullock and others, they were looking down at their own homes and valleys. I feel that this is something uh, we need to mull over some more. That Nepal is close to the world, but Nepal's villages are in poverty. The Sherpas from a, one corner are perhaps more poorer than other parts, even though a lot of them took to trading. So they end up in Darjeeling to do work as the, work, the, language, the terminology of the day, coolies. They get picked up their ability, their acumen is seen and they rise. But they are looking down at their own valleys, valleys that could not sustain them, a nation, a country, a government that would not support them. And they were going away and yet coming back and looking at their own valley from
from this roundabout way. In his writings, Mallory mostly refers to the Sherpas as coolies, as opposed to the Shahibs the, in uppercase S. Coolies in lowercase c, Shahibs in uppercase S. And only in some places as porters. He was accused of poor judgment and negligence by some in the death of the seven Sherpas in 1922, particularly Dr. Longstaff of the 1922 expedition. <clears throat> Mallory seemed, however, quite concerned about the care of the supporting climbers and believed that the summit has to be abandoned if it is a choice between that and saving the life of a porter who needs escorting down the mountain, wrote Mallory. The obligation is the same whether he be sahib or kuli. If we ask a man to carry our load up the mountain, we must care for his welfare and need. Mallory, Mallory felt deeply his inability to communicate with the Sherpas. Having tried to learn the language in Darjeeling and given up uh, other than learning a hundred or so words. He wrote of the 1921 expedition and you can see his humor coming through. Our experiment uh, our experiment, meaning the expedition, our experiment was deficient in one, no, this is indeed expedition. Our expedition was deficient in one, res in one respect. We were short of words. And so, there must be a way to research the names of the porters of the three Everest expeditions of, in which Mallory was part, including the seven who died in 1922. Similarly, it would be interesting to know of the Sherpas who christened the mountain Umori, the exact group, the small group, Tukri, if you will, which went up. Unless I'm corrected, Pumori, Claire Peak, Claire Peak like Sherpa, Pumori, Bane, Molay Chaso, Kobisa, Ile, T. Sherpa Harukothi, just like Abu Bishma Gungun Gungun Gare, and Kerry Yota Claire Peak, Usko Chori Raisa, Chori Bane, Chori Bane, Pumo, Pumo Peak. One of the Sherpa, Asama Kuragarbe, you got to go Hunu Porta. Two one they can, who are they? The, in particular, the name of those in that particular group. And then at one point, similarly, at one, similarly, it would be interesting to know of the Sherpas who christened the mountain Pumori after Clare Peak. At one point, Mallory refers to Sanglu, the acting Sardar, <clears throat> and Chitang Lexa, we don't understand what it means, as Sardar. Dorji Gompa, probably Dorji Gumbu, and Dukpa, who seems to have been the main cook. More than once, there is reference to Gyaljin. I would suspect in the records, and uh, those who have researched more than me would probably know, there must be a name list of the, all the Sherpas and others who go there. And uh, I would make just one, before reading out my last paragraph, I would make one point talking earlier to um, Khimlal Gautamji. Uh, he referred to how there were others also on the climbs of Everest. And while we speak about, about, um, about the Sherpas, we must also remember there were other ethnicities in the climb, uh, especially from the British Gorkhas, NCOs, non-commissioned officers in uh, Europe, climbing the Alps for the British. Tejbir Buddha. He, uh, his research, much more prodigious than mine, uh, indicates that Tejbir Buddha is referred to again and again as a star and also the one to reach the highest for a, what the British will call native. Um, but uh, let me just end now then with this uh, reference. When Everest was called Everest, Sir George Everest was in comfortable retirement and a gentleman named Wah, W-A-U-G-H, decided to name it after his former boss of the India Trigonometric, Great India Trigonometric Survey. There was some, uh, there was some opposition to it, particularly from our great uh, historical, what I would call honorary Nepali, Hodson, Brian Hodson, who says this peak is actually known to the locals as Dev Dunga. Spelled Dio Dunga, D E O, saying that 
Nepalis knew of this because they have traveled to Lhasa. This is on the route, close to the route from Kuti towards Lhasa. They know of it and they call it Deodunga. And the placement is just right. But then the, the young husband and his clique, if I may, considered the objections of uh, uh, Hudson and overruled him. And Everest it remains and Everest it is. Chomalungma, of course, and there was one particular incident where um, after they finished with west of the mountain, they went over to the east, Kharta, Kama Valley, and they once they were diverted southward towards Makalu. And they asked the local guide, why have you taken us there? They said, well, that's also Chomalongma. So it turns out, according to Mallory, and he uses the word Chomalongma, that uh, the, the locals, some of the locals thought there were two Chomalongmas. And so then the course corrected and came towards the pass that ultimately led them down to the East Rongbuk Glacier, not the regular route from the north, which is coming up the Rongbuk Glacier and taking the East Rongbuk small gap and then coming up the North Pole, but coming from the east, Kharta, which is essentially uh, a valley that is uh, uh, quite neglected now. But from what I understand, Ton Tenzing Norge's family comes from Kharta and was working probably household help in Thame and Kumjung. So Tenzing Norge's own uh, history goes to Kharta from what I understand. So in a way, we come full circle. And I will not now, of course, take you into 1922 and 1924 because my main interest has indeed been the 1921 expedition and the link between Mallory, Everest, Pumori, and of course, those of us who live south of the range called the Mahalangur Himal. Perhaps my last paragraph. An, an example can be seen in the case of Chomalunga itself overtaken as if as it has been by Everest and Sagarmatha. Even Dev Dunga did not make it. On their explorations of the eastern approach of, from the Kharta Valley, Mallory and his team were, were led southward towards Makalu rather than Everest, which was the goal. Trying to understand why they were led astray, Mallory writes that the guides seem to know of two Chomalongmas. Clearly, there were names for the mountains. And so why was there a need for Clare Peak? Why did uh, Mallory feel a need to name the peak Clare Peak. Did the locals not know to tell him? This is a question already maybe an answer in the literature. I do not know. Perhaps the Sherpas in the team did not know the indigenous name for Pumori if there was one. But that is unlikely. Because Pumori is right at the head of the valley. It's more prominent for Khumbu people even more than Mount Everest. Chomalongma. So, it is quite likely that Pumori had its own name, but that it got overtaken by this particular appellation given by a famous mountaineer, carried into the local language by the uh, supporting Sherpas, and then uh, it traveled the world, and maybe the local name went into decline. This is something for our local uh, experts to tell us about. So, perhaps the Sherpas in the team did not know the indigenous name for Pumori, if there was one, but that is unlikely. But when they learned about Clare Peak and then decided that it would be Pumori, the name stuck. All one can say for now is that it is a fine name for a beautiful mountain. And one might say the daughter of Chomolang Chomolongma standing to one side. Thank you. What I would say is because I've spoken somewhat longer than I planned, if there were anything to be added to or corrected, including the very premise I have that uh, Pumori was a uh, 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 transitioning of Clare Peak into Daughter Peak, uh, I would be happy to hear from any of you or anything else extra that you'd like to share. Huh? Oh, well, this was going to be after, as we are saying goodbye, but I might as well, since there were, seem to have been no comments, let me just make this. Uh, this is Shanta over there, who I am married to, and myself. 
uh, trailing because I had some altitude sickness. But Shanta was going strong even with a wounded ankle. Uh, this is uh, Renjola uh, two months ago. Renjola at 17,500 feet or so. And looking back, and it is a telephoto, I'll have to tell you. But what I found incredible in this photograph, of course, is essentially the terrain for, for now, for this present, sake of this presentation, essentially the terrain that uh, Mallory was looking down from his eye ray up in the high pass below Mount Everest. May yeah. I ask uh, Reinhold Messner to say a few words and conclude this meeting? I know it's unexpected, but since you happen to be here, and I think the audience would want that. Yes, I'll send it to you. You can buy and about the rent and I knew that they had not a good relationship, but anyway, young husband was the motor of this DLS uh, expeditions. And what happened exactly in 1903, 1904, we know, but in this expedition, he went to NASA, he went to the Dalai Lama, and he got the permit for the English to cross the uh, Tibet to reach Mount Everest without the permit, they could not be approach the mountain. And uh, this is exactly history on the back side. Maybe I, I was not uh, lucky enough to find it. Uh -huh, I'll send it to you. I'll give it to you. I will be very, very uh, happy. And your your book, um, uh, The Second Death of Mallory, uh, you could just tell us, uh, I didn't refer to it in my presentation, but why you felt the need to write that book and then that would add to our understanding. I had my first um, contact with Mallory in detail in '80 when I climbed the north side of Mount Everest. I crossed below the summit ridge, knowing that the summit ridge would be quite difficult, and there was many snow between my line and the Mallory line, and I could not touch the Mallory line in the upper part. But having spoken with Odell by myself, oh. I was very happy about it, uh, having seen the shin, I know there's no doubt Mary and Irvine did not go to the sun. The second step in 2000, now in 1924, was not possible for nobody. And in reality, the Chinese, when they climbed up after this second step in 60, they didn't go higher. Uh, they found out there is no way for normal climbers <laughs> with, with the equipment they had. And so they went back and in the next expedition they took out up, up the ladders. And with the ladders, one ladder above the other, they were able to overcome the second step. Of course, this was not um, by fair means climbing, this was technically climbing. But in 24, Manor and Urban did not have any uh, help and not any equipment for overcoming the circumstances. Odell also told me that you could not say if he has seen Manor and Urban climbing in a move on the second step or maybe on the first step. But describing to me, in our night we had been met together in London, describing to me how he had seen these two figures. He has seen one figure on the edge, on a flat edge, and the next one on a steep step. And the next one went up in three minutes on the second step of sinking. <laughs> now the best climbers of the world, they need 20 minutes, 30 minutes to do the second step. with totally different equipment. We have all right to think about the equipment they had, if we speak about historical uh, facts. I also think that Mallory was on the Lola, and could look down to okay. the Google okay, so. Ice I cannot prove it, but I think in his uh, letters and in his big article he wrote afterwards, uh, he's telling I, this is a product, they could see down the ice fall, the Google Ice fall, and they decided this is, there's no way up. Mm -hmm. And so they, they stuck on the north side, uh, side and they find also the right way of Mallory to find, Mallory to find the right way 
up to the North Pole. North Pole. But uh, my experience about analyst uh, cycle tests, when I heard that um, an expedition led by, I don't know, by an American, I think, found the body, I was very enthusiastic, knowing how the body is like there, what is the equipment he has. If he would have special rock climbing boots on his feet. So the chances from impossible circumstance to maybe possible would be given. But when I have seen later on the photos with the shoes and with the, the nails, yeah, uh, hot nailed boots. Yeah, very perfect shoes for, for the climb, but not for the second step. I knew he did not go to the sun. And I was just walking then on the be beginning of my idea to build up a museum on mountaineering, on mountains, on, on relationship between mountains and human beings. And I got two, late, two weeks later uh, facts or some information um, from, from somewhere asking if we would help them write a book about memory up to 1999 when he found him. And I answered, okay, I will help you. I will be at your disposal. I don't ask any money for writing, for helping, but I would like to get the shoe <laughs> from our museum. <laughs> and they answered, but they did not really give an answer. And we had three letters passing by, and never I find out that and say, okay, you get the shoe and you have us. And after the third letter, I decided I do my book. <laughs> I did it in two weeks. Wow. <clears throat> and I invented the trick, it's a trick, a little a trick, that I broke the memory, let it sit there for 75 years, and overview in what's happening. And so the key uh, sentence is very simple. When Hillary and Tenzin reaches the sun, he's there and see that he see that. And he says, Hillary is first, no doubt. So he says, I was not on the sun. Yeah. But I had the miss because oh. I disappeared. Oh. And it's much stronger disappearing than conquering mountains. Would, 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 uh, just one last question, uh, Mr. Messner. Would um, Mallory have been happy, in your view, because you intensely looked into his personality, the way Himalayan mountaineering has gone, of which you are a critic, what would Mallory say? I think that Mallory, today, if he would still be alive, he would only shake his head. Thank you, sir. Thank you. The boots. Where are <laughs> <laughs> the, the boots are, are gone to America. I don't know who has them. They are not in, in the public. Uh, Con Conrad Anker. Oh, yeah. But he did not take the Conrad Anker take found the boots. Yeah, he didn't take it. It's also very interesting that Conrad Anker found the body in a place where nobody was thinking that the body is. Because Hamlet, who was there as a historian, has not the slightest idea about about Malani, about the whole history. And he decided that this is the place to look for. And when Anka, I know him very well, went right side, right side, he on the phone from the base camp said, no, go back, this is dangerous, there is nobody. And there he found the body. And there is no, no doubt that they fell, but why, you don't know. Probably in the night, or maybe in the mist, so it was misty, it was windy. It was I am. Do not um, hope for uh, that's a great, a great sentence. Erwartet keine Gnade von Erwer in English. Erwartet keine Gnade, was heißt Gnade? Do not expect some nobody speak German here. Gnade. Is this Mallory or Anchor? No, 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 Mallory. Mallory, yeah. yeah. Do not expect any um, mercy. I've got it in here. Read my article. <laughs> I, I don't think it's worth It's got it. It's, so a, it's, it's a, a very hard thing. He was bad. 
but only in the way he approached it. Not approaching Get it? it. Huh? I got information today that on none of them. Oh, yeah, yeah. Share my picture. From Ken Share my picture. 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 They don't climb them. Half of the way they will do the helicopter. 38 times the helicopter flew people down in the middle of the base camp to Ken. Got information today. Thank you. Yeah. There's not any more mountain here because it's tourism. Tourism. <laughs> There's, since uh, we brought uh, Reinhold back to the mic twice, uh, I'm coming back to the mic once. There's something I forgot to share with you. The Sherpas. This was supposed to be the, my slides to go with the photographs. These are pictures by Mallory. And after having said all I did about the Sherpas, let us look at this. Uh, you long shot, oh? Long shot, you know. In this, you'll notice the, the, the faces. You'll see that... Uh, how rudimentary is the equipment and they actually don't even have certainly no carabiners no other equipment but tied ropes tied around their midriff and uh, if you go to the close-up uh, yes so when we are talking about who were these uh, sherpas we have uh, close-ups of at least three of them and there would be many more pictures of other sherpas in other by other climbers but there are three or four things i wanted to mention here one is uh, the clothing, the other is the one on the right, rightmost, has a box and that may carry the camera. But if you see, he's wearing our regular Daura Sural. So he's wearing a Daura Sural high up on the mountain. Uh, and uh, I just leave you with this image as a tribute to the Sherpas and the other mountain climbers of other ethnicities from then till now. Thank you all. Lady, come on.